Good morning. Welcome to Rock of Ages. My name is Doug and I'm one of the elders at the church here. It is Sunday, January 17th, and welcome to our worship service. I have just a few announcements I want to go over here this morning. It is a story Sunday, and uh, so you're going to hear two stories this morning, one from a gentleman by the name of Earl and one from a woman named Cheryl. So I know you will enjoy these stories. Sunday School will be happening uh, today at 11.30 in Zoom. And if you need the link, just email Shauna at that email address and she will set you up. Grace Builders will be starting soon. Uh, but look for an email and some information about that. Um, Pastor Jean will be leading Grace Builders. And again, as I said, that'll be starting soon. Youth uh, has been meeting fairly regularly and uh, Kenton Clausen is our youth leader and he will, uh, they, they like to use Instagram and Facebook for their uh, communication and so uh, those of you that are in youth continue to look for those updates. If uh, the parents or anybody needs to contact Kenton there's his cell number and there is his email address. Men's ministry is going to be starting uh, Wild at Heart John Eldridge study very very soon uh, probably near the end of January and uh, Stuart Kasdorf is the main contact there there's his email address and uh, just a shout out to all the men uh, that's going to be a great study. Monday Night Prayer has been running for a while via Zoom, but uh, recently it's also available for people in, in our church building. Uh, there is the information to get on with Zoom there, and Doug Anderson is the contact person, and his cell phone number is there as well as his email address. There will be an important congregational meeting at 7 o'clock on Monday, February 1st. That'll be a Zoom meeting. There will be some Zoom information sent shortly. The main purpose of the meeting is to uh, make a decision on some proposed bylaw changes. And there, there also will be some information about establishing a call committee for the calling of our new pastor. Uh, we are going to be having an alpha series run via Zoom online. Brent and Allison Weedy will be leading it. It'll be 11 weeks and approximately 16 sessions. The very first session will be this coming Saturday, January 23rd at 8 p.m. Uh, via Zoom um, and they'll just sort of talk about some introductory things about that Alpha study. There's an email address there uh, to get a hold of Allison or Brent and there's also a cell phone number there. Thanks again to the Wheaties for uh, starting the online Alpha. Allison's going to be a busy lady because she's also starting a Forensic Faith for Young Women study and this is a Bible-based study which will be happening the last Thursday of each month and it begins via Zoom on January 28th. The format will be 8.30, uh, get on Zoom, have a little informal visit for about 15 minutes, and then for the next hour have the Bible-based study. And uh, so contact Allison Weedy if you're interested. Again, there is Allison's address, bweedy at shaw.ca, or you can text or call her 306-291-2359. And for any of the young women that are considering this, uh, wondering, you know, who is this uh, study by, it's an author by the name of J. Warner Wallace, and he is a homicide detective who makes the case for a more reasonable evidential Christian faith. Sounds very exciting. The next two Sundays in January, uh, we will have a message from Pastor Gene. So that's the 24th next Sunday and also the following, the final Sunday of January, January 31st. And if you would like to share your faith story or testimony at an upcoming Story Sunday, all you have to do is get a hold of me, Doug Nya, there's my cell number, and I would be happy to work with you. I've done the Story Sundays via Zoom and recorded it that way. Sometimes, as in this week, I, I would meet with somebody in their house with my mask on and following all COVID procedures and would record their faith story. So there's lots of ways to do it, but as you can see, the date's there. Uh, basically, the third Sunday in every month uh, is going to be a Story Sunday, and we started that last February. And I know the stories have been a blessing to all of you. I've heard so much positive feedback about um, appreciating hearing people's faith stories. So we want to continue this. And I'm thinking, wouldn't it be amazing if my cell phone was just ringing like crazy for the next couple of weeks and I could just schedule people for all those Sundays. So I'm praying about that. And again, um, 
it's always a little bit of a hesitation at first. People think, well, you know, do I have a story to tell? Everyone has a story to tell. So I just want to encourage you, if you want to be involved in Story Sunday, there are the dates we'll be doing it, and I would love to work with you to get those stories recorded and ready to um, share with the rest of our people. As a call to worship this morning, I'd like to read from Acts chapter 20, verse 24. I'm going to read from the Amplified Version. It just adds in a little more um, detail, which I think makes the, the text even just a little more rich. So Acts chapter 20, verse 24 says, But I do not consider my life as something of value or dear to me, so that I may, with joy, finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify faithfully of the good news of God's precious, undeserved grace, which makes us free of the guilt of sin and grants us eternal life. I want to thank you all for gathering this morning. I know you will enjoy these upcoming faith stories. As I said, the first story you'll hear is a gentleman by the name of Earl Palmer, and the second one will be a woman by the name of Cheryl Salt. So enjoy these faith stories and enjoy the rest of your day. And just a couple final brief things to share. Um, you've all been sort of watching the news and, and what Sask, Sask Health has been reporting about COVID-19. And we know that things aren't great in our province right now. And I, I just want to assure you that the elders will be meeting this weekend to decide um, further action, whether or not our church should basically remain kind of closed for a little while or whether it will gradually reopen. We will let you know via email and we might even have a recorded elder um, video to just to share that in our Facebook group and our YouTube channel for everybody. So we will um, give you an update early this next week. Also I want to share some uh, some Thanksgiving. Um, our December uh, financial report came in for the church and our giving was amazing. Um, I think just as good or very similar to what we had even a year ago. And so I just want to, on behalf of the elders and all the staff and the ministry leaders, we want to say a huge thank you to you for the generous giving in 2020. And we are also wanting to encourage you to continue with your generous gifts for the church and now in 2021. So thanks for all that generosity. And we are, um, we are praying that that continues into the future. So uh, that is it for me. Enjoy these faith stories. Don't forget there will be three worship songs that you can listen to at the end of the service, or some of you may have already listened to the songs. They're available in our Facebook group, and they're also available uh, under a playlist for this date, uh, January 17th. You can see them there in our YouTube channel. So have a wonderful day, everyone, and we will see you soon. Hello, um, my name is Earl Palmer, and I want to... Uh thank the Rock Assemb uh, Ages Assembly for giving me this opportunity to present my testimony. And it's a testimony of the grace and mercy of God. And to put you in remembrance, God's grace is the unearned, undeserved favor of God. Keep that in mind. Now, the scene of uh, this, uh, this particular testimony was back in Regina in 1974. Now you say, that's a long time ago, <laughs> and it is. But remember, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, when I was in Regina at this time, I was not a Christian. And I wasn't a denier of the faith. Uh, I think the best way I could describe myself is I was a, a doubting Thomas. And uh, the only religious experience I had was when I was in about grade four or five. We lived next door to the United Church, and they enrolled me into their uh, Sunday school. And I would memorized the 23rd Psalm and the Lord's Prayer. And I had that in my head as a young lad, but I didn't really understand what I'd memorized. Well, then we moved away from uh, that area, and uh, we're into a in the outskirts of Regina, and there wasn't any church around there, so I never entered another church until I got married. Now, at this time in uh, Regina, uh, my wife was, uh, uh, had got favor in, in, in meeting with a lady across the street, Marge, and, 
and she introduced her to her pastor at the uh, Evanhurst Pentecostal Assembly. So she started to attend there, and my daughter, who had just graduated out of high school, she started going with her too, but I didn't go. But it worked out okay for me because they would go to church on Sunday and I'd go on my motorbike and tool around town. Then one day, uh, Judy came to me and she said, you know, the ladies at, at the church, they've been talking about this uh, banquet that people go to and they got people giving these testimonies. And uh, it's called uh, uh, the businessmen's uh, assembly and um, full gospel assembly. So and I thought, oh, this is one of those, and they're going to ask you to go. And I thought, oh boy, that's one of those religious things. And I don't want to go to that. But uh, because of her relation with them, I'm kind of obligated to go. So I thought, well, okay. Instead of going kicking and screaming, I'll take the high road, and when they ask me, I'll say, yes, of course, I'll go. I'll attend, and then after it's over with, I'll say, thanks for inviting me, but it's not for me. So that was my game plan. Sure enough, a couple of weeks later, I uh, got the invitation. I said, yes, I'll go. So then we went to uh, this uh, assembly, and and after the meal, uh, uh, there was two fellows who were going to give their testimony. And the first one was the short, shortest uh, testimony. So he started to give the testimony. And, Gee, you caught my attention. I thought, this sounds interesting. I'd like to hear more. So the next fellow gets up and he starts to give his testimony. And he starts talking about the miracles of God, how God was working in his life. And I thought, I wonder if that would work against uh, smoking. And the minute I said that in my mind, from the stage, he said, now, if you want to stop smoking, well, it caught my attention right there. And because for years I've been trying to stop smoking, I tried everything, green pills, everything, nothing worked. And I thought, oh boy. So now I'm really listening to him. Then a couple of minutes later, he went on, he said something, he was talking about something else. And to this day, I can't remember what it was, but I thought it in my mind, and as soon as I thought about it, the answer came back from the stage. I said, this guy read in my mind, what's going on here? Anyway, uh, when he'd finished his, uh, his testimony, I thought, you know, if I ever saw one of those miracles like what he was talking about, how could I not believe? And then they did a nice thing. They had everybody stand up and say the sinner's prayer. And I said it with everybody. But I was so full of uh, what I'd heard, and, and I said it with complete sincerity in and, and my mind and my, and my being, and I repeated it. After it was over, well, there was no bells, horns, or whistles, nothing, but anyway, um, we fellowshiped around a little bit, and I saw a couple of businessmen that I knew, and I was kind of surprised to see them there. They were probably just as surprised to see me there. We went home. The next morning, I get out, get in the car, fire up the car. And for years, the first thing I do when I start up the car, I had this tickle that I gotta have a cigarette. That morning I fired it up and I didn't have a tickle. And I said, oh God, is this from you? Oh God, can you get me to work without having a cigarette? Got to work. We had this kind of ritual that uh, we'd get to work in the morning, we'd all have a coffee and a cigarette. And back in those days, everybody smoked. You smoked at work as well. So uh, everybody was around, and I had my coffee, and I wasn't smoking. And somebody said, here, do you want a cigarette? I said, no, no. I grabbed my coffee and went up to my office, closed the door, and I said, oh, God, can you get me through till noon without a cigarette? And at noon, I had to go to the, the dentist, and you don't smoke in the dentist chair. So anyway, I come back after no, no desire for cigarette. After lunch, I came back and into the office again, and I said, Lord, can you get me through till quitting time without a cigarette? Well, I got through. Got home, and, and, and usually I didn't smoke when I got home. So I was figured I was pretty well home free. And wow, wow, I had a whole day without a desire for cigarette. So the next morning, I got in the car again and fired up, and again, no desire. And then it came over me. Oh, God, is this from you? Oh, 
you're real. There is a God real. And the joy that filled me, oh man, I was just full of joy. And I just want to hug everybody I ran across. I didn't do it, but I sure wanted to. And then uh, I was just enjoying this. Now, I, I wanted to be delivered from tobacco, but I didn't ask to be delivered from alcohol because I enjoyed it. And uh, so I would have a few drinks every day. And the previous job I was at, after work, we'd all go and have beer and everything. And then, uh, but, but since I was at now on a new job, I didn't fellowship with the, the staff that way. And, and uh, so anyway, I'd have these drinks. So one night I'm sitting there and Judy says, uh, are you gonna have, a, have uh, you want to have you drink and, uh, alcohol? And I said, no, I don't think I, I do. I don't feel like it. So I went a couple of days without it, and then, I, then I'd take one and took it again. And after a few weeks, I'd skip and so Then I said to myself, you know, I've lost my taste for alcohol. And, uh, and even when I take it, it doesn't do anything for me or to me. So then why am I doing it? So when that bottle was empty, I never bought another bottle. So I, uh, I, and I was just full of the joy of the Lord. Now, I'd like to explain something else that happened. Uh, when we would moved into that house, I was doing some plumbing in the washroom, and I had to unscrew a, a pipe that was seized up. So I got my pipe wrench, and I got on there, and I couldn't get it, and I got mad, and I reefed on it, and I got this uh, loosened up. But, oh, did I get this pain in my elbow. I don't know what kind of, oh. And it bothered me so much. Over that period of time, it never went away. It got to the point where I couldn't play golf. And I started thinking one day, well, you know, after the church service, they have a, an altar call to come up for healing. So I thought, why don't I go up and, and get my arm healed? So that Sunday, I went to church and uh, went, sat through the church. Oh, my elbow wasn't bothering me in bed. So when they had the altar call, I thought, I don't want to go up in front of everybody, and I, I, I don't think I'll do that. So I stepped, so I left the church. And the minute I stepped outside the church, oh, did I, a pain hit me, and I, oh, man, it, and did it hurt. And why didn't I go forward? And I've got to wait till next week. Oh, man. And then it dawned on me, tomorrow is Monday, and it's the second Monday of the month, and that's when the full gospel have their meeting, and they have an altar call for people who want healing. And there's always 30 or 40 people go up and I'll just slide in with that bunch and get, get them to um, pray to her. So that's what I did. Went in there on Monday and uh, at the end of the service, it came up and said, now uh, the altar's open for anybody who wants to come up and have prayer for any healing. So I looked around. 120 people in there, and nobody moved. No, usually the cast of thousands go up and oh no. So then I, I gotta get up. I stood up, and as soon as I stood up, this heat came over my whole body, down through my body, down my arm. My arm was healed right there. Well, I went for it anyway, and, and, the, and, the, and the fellow doing the, uh, the praying, he said, thanks brother for coming up. <laughs> So he started, to, and I told him that I was about my elbow, and he, so he started to pray for me. Then 30 or 40 people all came up. So that was basically what was, was happening. And, uh, and God is, uh, takes hold of me, and, and what he was doing is cleaning me up. And, and the other thing I noticed, too, is that my language cleaned up. Those cross words weren't slipping in anymore. And the odd time I'd make a mistake, and oh, I feel so bad about it, but I pray about it and ask for forgiveness. So I just want to say that God, there's many other things I could tell you about it, but I'd like to leave you with, with this message, is that many times people have been going to church for years and years, but they haven't accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And I can tell you, even though you've been baptized or uh, done all kinds of good work, made donations to food banks and things like that, that's all good works. But if you have not had 
a personal relationship with Jesus, you are not saved. So I tell you this, you can do it right now. You can, you can do the sinner's prayer. And what you do is you come and you have to feel in your heart and believe that Jesus went to the cross and paid for your sins. And, and you ask for forgiveness of all your accumulated sins. And then you say, I want to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And I ask for the, the salvation and eternal life with God. It's just the three steps. Acknowledge that God, that Jesus paid the price on the cross. Ask for forgiveness of all your accumulated sins and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And you will be filled with the Holy Spirit and he will show you that you have been saved and many things will happen to you. So I, I leave you with that and, and may God bless you. Good morning, Rock of Ages family. Um, it's fun to be able to talk to you this morning and uh, to actually converse with you without a mask on. Maybe that day will come again. Uh, when Doug asked me to share my story, I felt very hesitant because I thought, you know, I don't really have an exciting story to tell. But I guess all of us do have a story of our lives and and even listening to some of the stories that uh, you others have shared in the past have helped me get to know you a little better. So this is uh, an opportunity for you to get to know me a little bit and to um, and to hear something of how God has uh, uh, been revealing himself in my life. Um, my name is Cheryl Salt, and Bill and I have been attending uh, Rock of Ages for about the last 14 years. I've made some notes, so I'm going to be looking at my paper once in a while just to keep myself on track, because I can get sidetracked sometimes and go off on tangents. Um, but at the very beginning, my life started um, on a farm at Spalding. I was the oldest of six children. And uh, I think my brother Lowell shared his story uh, a few weeks back. So now you're hearing, now you're hearing my side of the story. <laughs> we grew up in a Christian home, and uh, life on the farm was great. I, uh, <laughs> I said, you know, it was a mixture of lots of hard work and tons of fun. Um, when I was thinking back over my story and just recalling some of those things about life on the farm, I. I thought about how it seemed that our parents kept our noses to the grindstone and maybe there was a method in their madness. With, with six of us, they had to keep some semblance of order. So my mom kept us busy in the garden, picking peas, weeding long rows, hilling potatoes. Uh, the boys were often helping dad out in the shop or on the fields and um, there was always uh, work to do with animals and um, whether it was uh, chasing wandering sheep back that had gotten out of their fences or uh, milking cows or whatever it was, there was always something to do. Um, I remember when shortly after Bill and I were married uh, and my parents were getting a little bit older, so mom had said, oh, when you, when you guys come out to the farm, I'd like you to help me hill. I just have a couple rows of potatoes to hill and if you could give me a hand hilling those. And um, we were all gung-ho to help mom and dad. And so on the way home, <laughs> Billy said to me, but she didn't tell us that those rows were a mile long each. <laughs> so that was what it was like on the farm. Nothing was done in, on a small scale. It was always, um, there was always lots to do. Um, I... I um, I often think of uh, of things like uh, picking peas, um, taking taking hot meals out to the fields. It was always kind of exciting to the men that were harvesting uh, as they tried to squeeze out the last rounds on the combine before the dew got too heavy. Uh, but mom and dad always tried to reward our hard work with some family adventures and. Um, some of the best memories are those times that we went camping and fishing up to some northern remote lake. And and um, and I remember one summer, Dad decided he was going to try to teach us kids how to water ski. We were we were 
probably 10, 11 years old. And so he purchased a bigger motor for our little fishing boat. And uh, sure enough, got us up on, on our wobbly legs on the, on the uh, skis. And um, I just remember how scary it was to be pulled out of the water, but then how exhilarating it was to be skimming across the smooth as glass uh, lake. Uh, we had a little lake just a few miles from our house, so we often went down there in an evening to have a picnic or to just um, try some water skiing. The only problem was dad thought it was so much fun that he wanted to do it, but the motor wasn't big enough to pull my dad out of the lake. So he would get waist deep out of the water and then it just didn't have enough um, enough uh, horsepower to get him up. So he missed out on the fun. Um, with cousins just across the road, there was never a dull moment. There was always somebody to play with. Uh, there were always uh, some exciting adventure to go on, from building tree forts to navigating sloughs on makeshift rafts. Uh, in the winter, we had skidoos that we played on, um, skating on frozen ponds and sloughs, um, hours spent over board games playing Monopoly. Um, sibling rivalry was always part of the fun, too, and I just have to... Uh, tell you a little story about the many times that, or the few times that um, I remember uh, fleeing down our gravel road with Lowell in hot pursuit with a, a garter snake dangling from his outstretched arm as, uh, as I raced down the road. And um, I had long abandoned my flip-flops and I was running on those sharp little stones on the gravel, but never felt one of them. I know you all think he's a great guy and he's very kind and loving, but there's another side to this guy. Um, my parents were very frugal and uh, not uh, not by choice maybe, but out of necessity. Credit cards had uh, really not been um, come into being yet. And uh, so there was always, um, there was always, um, a challenge to see how how far they could make the last dollar stretch. I remember mom crossing off lists from the gro grocery, crossing off items from the grocery list that she was sending into into town with dad to pick up. And uh, and I remember would from time to time her saying, I guess I really don't need those things this week. Maybe next week I'll get those. Um, but when the offering plate went by our family um, on Sunday morning, Mom and Dad always had an envelope to put in there. And for me, that spoke volumes. It it told me where their priorities were. It told me that um, that God was first and that um, um, tithing was more important than whether uh, we had uh, some fresh vegetable from the store or um, or some uh, special meat cuts or something. Um, they taught a lot uh, to us kids just by their example and uh, and by their role modeling. Church was never optional for us. Um, the only times I really remember missing church in Sunday school was uh, if we were deathly ill or if we were snowed in. Sunday school was a part of our um, our weekly uh, format. Uh, Bible camps in the summer were attended. Um, I remember two of the the, uh, the moms from our community uh, and that were part of the Gospel Mission Church had started a, a Friday afternoon uh, happy hour club, they called it, where they taught Bible stories and those stories just came to life with flannel graphs and uh, just the fun new courses we learned, the Bible uh, sword drills we did and the Bible quizzes they had just was a highlight of our week. Um, the spiritual legacy that my family left has had a lasting impression and impact on my life. Um, after uh, I graduated, uh, after actually I graduated from LCBI in grade 12, uh, mom and dad made the sacrifice to send me to LCBI and um, uh, I, it was my heart to go. I just wanted to go so badly. And uh, that was a great year uh, and graduated from LCBI from grade 12 there. 
After that, I took, I stayed on and went to uh, the one-year Bible program that was uh, in place at that time. Having had such a legacy uh, <laughs> from my from my growing up years and and just the Bible teaching and all the things that I had learned over the years as a young as a youngster growing up, I I felt I knew the Bible pretty good. But I remember as I was graduating from that uh, from that one year Bible program. Um, taking as my theme verse of that year, a verse from Romans um, 11.33 that says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. I learned in that year that I had only begun to scratch the surface of knowing my Bible or knowing um, how great my God really was. After uh, Bible school, I did a wonderful one-year stint at Koinonia House, and that's a whole nother, um, nother story to tell. And then I went into nurses' training. I've been so blessed by God's um, abundant grace and, and gifts in my life. Um, he's been so good to me. I've had a wonderful godly heritage, um, a great career in nursing. I've got a loving, wonderful husband, three great kids um, who've mostly stayed out of trouble. And I guess I say mostly because I'm sure they haven't told me everything. And maybe I'm glad. Um, in 2005, Bill and I uh, took on the challenge of developing an acreage. And so we moved out to a, a, an alfalfa field, basically uh, moved an existing older home out there and started developing an acreage. And at that time, I decided that um, uh, still trying to maintain uh, some part-time nursing, uh, developing an acreage, and then trying to shuffle the kids back and forth to school and music lessons and hockey, et cetera, et cetera, um, that homeschooling maybe was uh, something we should attempt. And so I homeschooled for a couple of years and those were great years and years I wouldn't trade for anything. I'm so thankful to God for the blessings and the good gifts that he has poured lavishly into my life. My spiritual journey has been pretty smooth sailing, but Satan is always on the prowl and his ways are often subtle and he uses tactics that often can derail us. And as I'm looking back over my journey, I think one of the traps that he has used to trip me up is the deception that God will accept me because of my good reputation, my good character references, or my performance records. Um, how I have needed the correction of the scriptures uh, to stop that deception from really taking root. Um, it's easy when, when life has been good and life has been easy and you've known, you've known the Lord from a child, to think that, um, well, I'm pretty good, and uh, that's what God requires. But I'm often reminded of, in that, that verse in um, Isaiah 64, 6, and I'm just going to read that. It says, we have all become like one who is unclean. All our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. And um, that verse has come to my mind often because it's made me realize that even my best efforts at being good or be doing it right or being perfect to God are like filthy rags. It just doesn't count one iota to him. Um, so that deception of self-righteousness is, is um, a close cousin to another trap that Satan often, um, I think, throws into my pathway, and that's the trap of legalism. Um, God has had to keep speaking to me about that too. Checking off my self-made lists of do's and don'ts uh, has either put me on a path of, of spiritual pride, thinking, oh, I've got this down, or it has put me on a path of self-condemnation, depending on which side of the page my check marks landed. Either way, the evil one wins. Ephesians uh, 2.8 says, um, uh, for by grace you have been saved through faith 
and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. When that realization awakens in me, the next verse takes on new meaning. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Anything good um, that I can do is already God's idea long before I was even born. It's all about him, really. But as much as I know this, Satan, Satan still likes to throw his darts. I'd like to tell you a story that illustrates. Those of you who know me well know that I thrive in my garden from spring until fall. A few years ago, I was uh, working in my very large strawberry bed, and it was just one of those beautiful uh, spring days with a very slight breeze, a warm sun, and the, the birds had come out of hiding from their winter retreats, and uh, it was just the most beautiful day. I had uh, purchased a, a load of straw bales from a local farmer, and I was really enjoying pulling those bales apart and just enjoying the fresh scent of that straw as it popped loose from the baler twines and I was spreading it around my new, newly growing strawberry plants. I was in my glory. But then thoughts started to cross my mind. And um, those thoughts started to kind of cast a shadow over the day. Things like, Shouldn't you be doing something more worthwhile with your time? Is your, just, is your life just about straw when there are homeless people that need to be fed? Shouldn't you be doing something more important with your time? And on and on the thoughts kept coming. I began to inwardly beat myself up and self-condemnation started to take over. I now know the source of those voices and those thoughts. John 10, 10 says, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Well, he sure was stealing my joy and my appreciation of God's amazing creation that day. I remember praying at that time when, those, when I was hearing those words, Lord, is that you talking to me? Is there really something else you want me to be doing today? Show me what it is, Lord. And I'll be obedient. At that very moment, he downloaded a memory into my mind of a time about seven years earlier when we were still living in Saskatoon. I'm going to read uh, to you my account of that memory. I was leaning at the sink, looking out the kitchen window toward the backyard where we had a garden plot. I was watching five-year-old Nathan slowly walking up and down the rows, checking for fresh peas, and checking the progress of the carrots, beans, and lettuce. When he came to the pumpkin vine, he stopped suddenly, bent down, then jumped up and raced toward the house. I smiled at the surge of warmth and love and excitement that fluttered within me because I too, just the day before, had seen the huge pumpkin blossoms hiding amongst those dark leaves. He burst breathlessly through the door. Mom, come quick, you just gotta see this. I followed him back to the garden and reveled with him in the wonder of creation and the magnificent pumpkin flowers. It was a moment of pure joy. As God replayed that memory for me, I heard him say, this is an emotional time for me to read this even. That's exactly how I felt about you when I looked from my heavenly window this morning and watched you playing in my backyard, reveling in my creation and enjoying the smells and sounds of the spring day that I made for your enjoyment. Carry on, my daughter. I love you. Since then, I have had a new understanding of God as my loving heavenly father, not my taskmaster, not my list checker, not my harsh critic. The older I get, the more I take delight in being his child. Romans 8.1 says, 
There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free. <clears throat> and in verse 15, he said, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit by which we cry, Abba, Father. I am learning to be less consumed with my performance for him and more desires of sitting at his feet. I am learning that he really wants a relationship with me. He wants my heart, not my righteous deeds, not my to-do list. I am learning to know in a more profound way what it means to be his daughter. Thank you for listening to this story, and I hope it can be an encouragement of some sort to you. Thank you.